Good evening. And thank you very much for attending this evening's lecture, which is made possible by the, Bo, um, the Bochelle Family Endowment. We are always happy and excited for scholars to inform us about the objects in our museum's collection. And I'm personally excited when the objects in question are from the Arts of Africa uh, collection. Tonight we will learn more about West African glass beads, which comprise about half of our African art collection, terracotta statuary, especially the figure from the bust from Sokoto, Nigeria, and woven textiles from West Africa as well as other weaving traditions. We are fortunate to have as our speaker, Professor Susan Keach McIntosh, who can teach us a lot about these objects. Susan Keach McIntosh is the Herbert S. Autry Professor of Anthropology at Rice University and served as Interim Dean of Social Sciences from 2019 through 2021. She attended Wellesley College and earned a BA degree from the University of Pennsylvania in anthropology with highest honors, summa cum laude. She holds an MA in archaeology from Cambridge University and a PhD in anthropology from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Her research focuses on West African societies living along the Niger and Senegal rivers uh, over the past 2,500 years with a special interest in the early emergence of large-scale complex societies and long-distance trading networks that are associated with the early empires of Ghana, Mala, Mali, and Takur, an ancient kingdom in West Africa that flourished along the same time as the Ghana Empire uh, and was located on the lower Senegal River. And of course, this is not to be mistaken with modern Ghana. Uh, and further, um, more, it's situated between the Ivory Coast and the Republic of Benin, which is not to be confused with the People's Republic of Benin. Uh, she also studies past uh, responses of African societies to climate and environmental change and writes and teaches on the politics of archaeology and archaeological representations. In the face of massive looting of terracotta statuettes from the from Niger River archaeological sites, she became involved in issues of archaeological heritage and cultural property and was appointed by former President Clinton to two terms from 1996 to 2003 on the Presidential Advisory Committee on Cultural Property. She serves as the editorial, uh, on the editorial boards of numerous journals, including the Journal of African Archaeology, Archaeologie Afrique et Art, and the journal uh, Journal des Africanistes, and as a past president of the Society of Africanist Archaeologists. Professor McIntosh is currently organizing the biennial meeting, or biannual meeting, of this society, which will meet at Rice University in June. And I'm hoping that sessions will be open to the general public, uh, because it sounds like it's going to be a very exciting um, learning experience. I believe many of us would like to know if these uh, sessions will be open to the public. Dr. McIntosh is a founding member of the Center for African and African American Studies at Rice and the recipient of Rice University Award for Excellence in University Service and Leadership. I could tell you more about Professor McIntosh's distinguished career, but now I'd like for you to join me in welcoming her to Dallas, to the DMA, and to this stage and podium. Dr. McIntosh. All yours. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you for that uh, incredibly generous introduction. I'm really delighted to be here tonight 
with you, and I thank the museum and the Bushell Family Endowment for the opportunity. I want to mention that um, the museum's manager of adult programs, Christina Echezareta, has been incredibly helpful in facilitating my visit. And I want to thank Dr. Walker for the invitation to speak and for the suggestion that I speak on a topic that connects with some aspect of the African collections here. This was not a difficulty whatsoever. The collections are extensive, and I quickly found not one, but three sets of materials that I could expand on tonight. Now, when I proposed to speak on hidden histories in this lecture, I honestly had no idea how vast the Hidden Histories franchise is. There are books, podcasts, TV shows, and a multitude of websites devoted to revealing neglected, overlooked, unsung, off the beaten track, or underappreciated aspects of history. But the histories that I want to talk about tonight are hidden for a different, more literal reason. They are underground, hidden from sight, until archaeological excavation and research reveals them. Um, you may call me partisan, but I regard archaeology as the most essential tool for understanding Africa's deep time past. And by deep time past, I mean the period before Arab and European travelers, traders, chroniclers, and officials began writing about sub-Saharan Africa, and the period beyond the reach, largely, of Africa's own recorded histories, either oral or written. So tonight I want to share with you three stories about West Africa's past where archaeology has deepened our understanding. So the first are Nok and Sokoto style terracottas from Nigeria. These are the oldest, well-developed, figurative terracotta traditions from West Africa, dating to the first millennium BC for the Nok style and perhaps slightly later for Sokoto style. The Dallas Museum has this fine example of a Sokoto style terracotta, which I was privileged to see on a visit to the collections with Dr. Walker today. The map shows the general area that produced these traditions. The red is the Nok culture area, and the blue, the Sokoto area. I'm going to be focusing on the Nok style terracottas tonight because much more of their story can be told thanks to a decade-long investigation of Nock sites by German archaeologists from Frankfurt University. Until the Germans began excavating in 2005, Nock terracottas were known almost exclusively from chance finds or clandestine excavations uh, to procure objects for the art market. The Nock style is very distinctive characterized by a rounded triangular eye with a pierced pupil, uh, distinctive eyebrows, often they're cross-hatched, elaborate and diverse hairstyles, and a profusion of fiber necklaces and belts. And you can see each of these has a fiber necklace. You see more of them here, these large gatherings of fibers around the neck uh, and also at the waist, sometimes on the arms as well. In the 1990s, a new kind of knock terracotta began appearing on the art market. They were large, complete figures, about a meter high, like you see on the right and the left here. And these gave a huge impetus to demand in the art market and consequently to looting. In one area of uh, Nigeria, police or the army intervened in the summer of 1994 to halt the illegal digging, but it resumed within a few months under the control of two main traders, each of which employed a thousand diggers. So you can imagine the extent and scale of the damage they were able to create. It was widely known in European art circles that the military government in power until 1999 was deeply involved in the traffic of knock terracottas and other Nigerian antiquities. The flood of knock pieces on European markets and also in America was so great that their price fell sharply in the 1990s. 
and one could buy knockheads for relatively little from online dealers as of 2006 when I grabbed this screenshot and you can get them for the relatively reasonable price at the time of between $1,000 and $10,000. So when the Germans undertook their survey beginning in 2005, what they found were Knox sites pockmarked with looting holes. 90% of the sites they visited had been looted, and the area that they worked, this is in the central area of the NAC distribution we saw in the earlier map. Uh, they visited, surveyed 165 sites in red, and they dug 49 of them in yellow. 90% seriously looted. And this situation of illicit looting and trade came to international notice in 1999 when French President Jacques Chirac pressed the Nigerian government to approve the Louvre's purchase of three knock terracottas. The problem was that Nigerian law made the export of Nigerian antiquities illegal unless authorized by Nigeria's National Commission on Museums and Monuments. That authorization had not been obtained. So the inter, this was quite an embarrassing incident, particularly since the International Council on Museums, ICOM, uh, brought it to international attention in view of the devastating looting that was occurring on these Knox sites. And this quite embarrassing turn of events was ultimately resolved after a fashion by the Nigerian government allowing display of the terracottas at the Louvre for a 25-year period loan from Nigeria. And you will note that this period is going to be up next year, and it will be interesting to see what exactly happens since the climate, uh, museum climate for antiquities has decidedly changed. So in 2005, when the Germans began their archaeological project, a full 65 years after the first chance discovery of a knock terracotta, we had no actual evidence for the kinds of societies that produced the terracottas, what they were used for, or who was represented. So knock society was actually, and the terracottas context was a matter of uh, largely conjecture, imagination, such as this, uh, imaginative construction of a Nock temple by the art historian Bernard de Grun. And he thought there would the Nock terracottas would have been arrayed around a central altar area in a temple with uh, lower mud walls and then thatch superstructure. Well, when the excavations began, the reality turned out to be substantially different. At all the sites excavated by the German team that had terracottas, these were always broken and found in pits mixed with broken pottery. No walls or structures of any kind were found. The pits were separated by sterile deposits without any archaeological material. So it appears that these pits were deliberately dug for the deposition of this broken material. And the living sites, the habitation sites, the domestic material uh, of everyday knock life, is, it hasn't been found. We don't know where it is. Um, the pits contained domesticated millet grains, so we know that the knock farmed but they must have had a relatively mobile lifestyle to account for the lack of domestic accumulation. Unfortunately, the soils here are quite acid, so bone of any kind has not been preserved. We don't know what kind of domestic animals they might have used, and we don't know if any of these pits might have been associated with human burials because we do not find the bones. The Germans did find separate iron smelting sites associated with knock pottery, and they excavated them. But these kinds of sites were not associated with terracottas. They did not find terracottas in them. So the terracottas that were recovered from excavation 
were dated by radiocarbon on the charred seeds and wood in the pits to the period 900 to 300 BC. I mean, really, for the first time, we have a very good, well-dated, uh, based on radiocarbon evidence, date for the period of the production of the knock terracottas. Breakage and incomplete terracottas were the norm. Not only did the Germans not find any intact terracottas in their excavations, they found no examples in the excavated sites of pieces where pieces of the original terracotta, all the pieces were present. The closest they came was this piece on the left, where you can see it's in several parts, but the base is missing. The terracotta fragments from the excavations characteristically had this deeply weathered surface that exposed the chopped up quartz, those are the white bits, that the artisans incorporated into the clay. So this raises questions about the terracottas that are fully intact and with smooth surfaces, like we saw in the earlier slides. The Germans also found and photographed modern artisans who produced convincing new versions of Knox style terracottas. Here is a fellow modeling, oops, sorry, oh. uh, modeling uh, one and using a, a wooden spatula to create all the details, the eye, uh, the fibers, etc. And he ends up with an example that looks very close to what we saw in that Louvre uh, example. So the Germans suspect that intact knock terracottas in collections either have been extensively remodeled from fragments or are wholesale forgeries. So the moral here is buyer beware if you're offered uh, a genuine knock terracotta and you're tempted to purchase it. So to return to the Sokoto style uh, terracottas, Although they clearly have some kind of relation to the Knox style terracottas, we just don't know what it is. Are they a derivative style that is later in time, perhaps? The Sokoto style was first documented fairly recently, only in 1992. And the eyes retain the rounded triangular shape, although it goes much lower down on the cheek. But there's the pierced pupil. But look what's happened to our cross-hatched eyebrows. They now have been moved down and are overhanging the eye, producing this distinctive hooded effect. The hair is no longer elaborate in the way the knock style was, and, the beard, and beards are common. In fact, most of the Sokoto style terracottas depict males. So there are no stories to tell yet about the Sokoto style terracottas and the societies that produced them. We need archaeological research before we can begin to produce those. So my next hidden history is about indigenous African textiles. And the Dallas Museum has some wonderful examples of indigenously woven and dyed textiles, all of which are 20th century in date. Three of these are woven of cotton, a plant that West Africa uh, first received, likely via the trans-Saharan trade sometime after 800 AD. Two of the cloths pictured here, Bogolan uh, from Mali and Kente cloth from Ghana, are woven on narrow strip looms, and then the three to five inch wide strips are sewn together to form the fabric. The Kuba cloth on the left is from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's woven of raffia fibers, an indigenous fiber technology that may have an ancient history in the forest about which we know very little. The known history of textiles in Sub-Saharan Africa has focused mainly on cotton and to a lesser extent on wool, while well, this has a restricted distribution in northern areas where herders raise sheep or cattle or, or camels, excuse me. And these were the dominant fibers in use at the time Europeans established trade relations and colonies. But what do we know of earlier indigenous textiles? So first, a little background. Weaving is an ancient technology. 
early cotton textiles in Peru date to 6500 BC, early cotton te textiles in India to 5000 BC, and these represent indigenous domestications of two different species of cotton and independent inventions of weaving. In Europe, the Near East, and Egypt, flax and wool were the most commonly woven fibers until the introduction of cotton at the end of the first millennium BC. We have an excellent idea uh, about the weaving technology used in ancient Egypt and Greece, for example, because they very kindly provided models of it for us. On the left is a clay model of a weaver's workshop from an 11th dynasty tomb about 2000 BC. And you can see the weavers are weaving on a horizontal loom. And over on the right side are women spinning flax. And then from Greece, uh, we have two weavers on either side of a vertical loom where the warp threads are weighted at the bottom to hold them in tension. This is a warp weighted loom. All right, we don't know anything about African looming and weaving technologies, but archaeology can help us. So let's return to cotton. Uh, cotton, the, its use and production dramatically expanded with the spread of Islam and Arab colonization of Southern Europe and North Africa in the seventh century AD and the establishment of extensive trans-Saharan trade networks, which go down uh, to the Niger Bend and also to the Senegal River, both areas where I've done research. The earliest, uh, sorry, uh, the arrival of spinning of cotton and weaving in Sub-Saharan Africa is generally recognized by the appearance of spindle whorls, used as the weights on spindles used to draw out the thread from a mass of carbon, car, co uh, cotton fibers, as you see these Nigerian women doing on the right. Uh, the spindle is down here. She's twisting it to draw out the thread from the mass of cotton fibers in her other hand, and then she will collect the thread at the bait, wind it onto the, the spindle, episodically. Spindle whorls appear at sites on the Niger and Senegal rivers by around 900 AD, and you see here uh, a sample of the spindle whorls found in a cache of about four dozen at the site of Jenny Geno in Mali, where, uh, which has been the focus of much of my research, and these date to around 1100. But the earliest find of actual cotton textiles in West Africa come from the Talim Caves of the Bandia Garda Escarpment in Mali. And I'm just showing you the location of it here to the east of the Niger River. These caves, and you can see the openings to the caves in the actual cliff face at Bandia Gara, were used as communal burial sites for hundreds of individuals between the 11th and 16th centuries. And some of these individuals were buried in tunics and caps or were wrapped in blankets, all of which had been woven on narrow strip looms. And you see an example of uh, one still in use today in Mali and in many places in West Africa, usually operated by men, men are the weavers. And the tunics and caps preserved in the Celt Talim caves are remarkably similar in style to tunics and caps worn in the area today. This cap was tie-dyed in indigo. It was worn extensively and washed before they were buried in it because it's that faded, wonderful faded indigo blue. But here is bright indigo, very freshly made, perhaps for uh, as a funerary blanket um, in the Talim caves. And of course, these kinds of these productions on um, narrow strip loom are being crowded out today by the ubiquity of Western clothing. So as I said, the known history of textiles in Sub-Saharan West Africa has largely focused on wool and more especially on cotton. But there are 
indigenous technologies that weave fibers of indigenous African plants, such as the raffia palm tree. However, the deep time history of these technologies in Africa is a real challenge to reconstruct. Why? Because organic materials generally do not preserve in savanna and forest regions. There are no pots or sculptures that depict weavers, not that we found so far. And raffia has very long fibers that do not need to be spun to form a continuous thread, so no spindle whirls. However, the archaeological discovery, quite an exceptional one, of ancient textiles in southeastern Nigeria at the site of Igbo Ukwu has allowed us to write a new chapter in the history of African textile technology. The site of Igbo Ukwu was excavated by the British archaeologist Thurston Shaw, who was one of my mentors at Cambridge, in 1960. In one part of the site, he uncovered a stunning collection of cast bronze objects, some of which you see here. They were created by the lost wax process. 145 pounds of bronze and copper objects arrayed horizontally, not far below the ground surface. They had been protected by an overlying wall that was removed before excavation. You know, the horizontal arrangement of so many objects suggested that they had been placed deliberately in that way as in a shrine or perhaps a repository of ritual objects. And this artist's reconstruction captures how they might have looked in that space based on the mapping of the object's position by Thurston Shaw. And of particular interest to our history of cloth is the textile shown in blue. Cloth was preserved at Igbo Ukwu by contact with the bronze objects. But the cloth was, in fact, white, not blue. It just shows up better in the reconstruction, I imagine. And that's why the artist colored it that way. And here on the left, you see some of this cloth actually coming up. These are pieces of cloth. These are copper chain. Here's a broken bronze sword scabbard. So you can see how closely in contact with the bronze and copper objects the cloth was. And that's what preserved it. And you see a fragment of this cloth curated at the British Museum on the right. And you see the green stain of the copper oxides that preserved the cloth. I applied for permission to obtain a postage stamp sized fragment of this cloth for radiocarbon dating. Prior to obtaining this new date, which you see at the top, we did not know the date of the shrine or of the cloth, but we now know that the cloth was produced almost 1,000 years ago. The cloth is very finely woven with a braided edge at the top. And magnification under an optical microscope shows smooth fibers. Let's see what happens that are quite different from the fuzzy fibers of cotton at similar magnification on the right. But we needed a scanning electron microscope to magnify the fibers enough to identify the plants they came from. Carolyn Cartwright at the British Museum did this work and identified the smooth, elongated fibers as fibers from a fig tree a ficus species. But raffia leaf fibers with their characteristic structure were also present. And here you can see that structure, those fibers peeking out under the fig tree's fibers so they were combined in the same cloth. All right, now, the fig tree fibers came from the inner bark or bast of the fig tree. And here's a cross section of the trunk of, of a fig tree. And here's the very thin, dark outer bark. But this orange stained area is the inner bark. 
that was used to make the textile. And we know how they removed the inner bark because people in parts of Africa today still make pounded bark cloth out of fig tree inner bark. This is not a textile that's woven. They remove the inner bark in long strips, wet it, let it, let it soak for a number of days, and then pound it with wooden beaters to consolidate the fibers. It's more like a felting process that we associate with wool. It's not a woven process. So here you see them removing the outer bark uh, with a, sorry, with a bamboo knife, just a shallow cut, and then making another set of cuts and then pulling out the inner bark in these long, thin strips. And for raffia, coming from the raffia palm, they take the young leaves and strip off the epidermis, the outer surface, and then let it dry and then using either a comb or fingers, divide it into strips. And when they use a comb, they can get very fine fibers that are suitable for weaving. For the thicker strips, you see them on some of the raffia skirts and whatnot. There's a great example in the Dallas Museum uh, collections of a head, uh, headdress uh, that was danced on a figure who had a voluminous raffia skirt and raffia is still being woven in parts of the Congo Basin today uh, on vertical looms like the one you see on the right, where it is again woven by men. Okay, so honestly, before I go to my next uh, hidden history, I just want to summarize that what archaeology coupled with scientific analysis has been able to reveal is this hidden deep time history of textiles in the forest zone of Nigeria. Uh, in this case, an advanced weaving tradition combining fig tree bast fibers and raffia fibers was in use a thousand years ago. And this is a weaving tradition that has largely disappeared from Africa. Okay, so now on to the beads, because our last hidden history is about glass in West Africa. And the Dallas Museum has a wonderful collection of Milfiori glass beads, which were manufactured in Venice for the African market in large numbers in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, so much so that they became widely known as African trade beads. But Milfiori patterns were just one of the glass patterns that Venice produced and traders carried to Africa for centuries. Venetian glass was, however, a relative latecomer to the glass bead trade in Africa. To understand the hidden history of glass in West Africa, we again need to rely on archaeology. So just a little bit of background. Glass is formed when sand, an alkaline soda and lime are fused at high temperatures. The color of the glass can be altered by adding metal oxides like tin or cobalt or copper. In the form of beads, glass is one of the best indicators of trade networks. Four things about them make them such powerful indicators of ancient trade networks. First, they're in demand because their visual qualities are captivating and almost magical in some ways. Secondly, they're relatively lightweight and easy to transport, even over long distances. Third, they do not decay easily in the ground, so we can find them in archaeological sites. And fourth, their chemical composition is like a fingerprint that we can use to identify the source area where the raw glass was produced. Now, while glass cannot in itself be dated, it can be dated by the charred wood that is found in the same layer using radiocarbon analysis. So all of these factors make glass beads incredibly useful for tracing West Africa's growing participation in far-flung trade networks. 
So I'm going to move on to that hidden history now. So glass beads have been recovered from quite a few West African sites of varying ages. Some, like Elmina in Ghana, date to the period of European contact. I want to focus on beads from earlier periods, from the first to the 12th centuries AD. And for this, I'll focus on the beads from four sites, highlighted here. Jenny Geno, Gao, down in the Nigerian forest, Ile Ife, and again, Igbo Ukwu. These are important, these sites have important bead assemblages that track connections and changes over much of the first millennium AD and into the early second. All right, so here's some maps that will show you visually how we now understand the bead trade to have grown over time. Here's the period 100 to 400 AD. We have a mere handful of beads, one to five glass beads at these sites. Two of them are from Jenny Geno. And the extreme rarity of beads during this time period suggests that the bead trade was not yet organized. Rather, beads may have been spread by hand-to-hand -hand exchange as gifts between mobile populations, such as camel, sheep, and cattle herders, who had pastoral, pastoralist networks that extended to the north and the northeast of Africa. By 500 to 600 ID, beads are still fairly rare, but I did have to change um, the frequency uh, of these. Some sites have between 10 and 50 now. But look what happens between 700 and 1100 AD. We have notably large numbers of glass beads along the Niger River at Gao and down here at Igbo Ukwu and also at Ileife, away from the river but the story there gets really interesting, and I'll return to that in a moment. So this striking growth in the number of glass beads reflects the organization of commercial trade along trans-Saharan routes in the 8th to 9th centuries. Arab chroniclers in the 10th and 11th centuries mentioned beads prominently among the trade goods that caravans carried south across the desert to trade for gold and other goods. And I've marked in red all of the trade towns and oases mentioned by the early Arabic sources. Gao is one of the trade towns mentioned very prominently. So, excavations by my former student, Mamadou Sissé at Gao, recovered a large number of glass beads from two different archeological sites. One site, Gao Sane, dates to the last centuries of the first millennium AD. The other, Gao Ancien, is a bit later in time. And the photos show the range of bead types that Mamadou recovered. Um, one sad aspect of this is that the massive amounts of glass and carnelian beads at Gaussane has attracted massive looting. Uh, these are for largely for sale internally in Africa. And this has destroyed a very large amount of the archaeological deposits of this huge site, um, almost 100 acres. And it really reduces the possibilities that we have in the future to understand other parts of the site beyond the three or four units that have been excavated so far. But at Gao Ancien, around 8,000 of the beads that Mamadou recovered came from this stone pillar structure that was built in the 10th century. It may have been part of an elite residence since other luxury goods including small amounts of gold, glazed North African pottery, and glass vessels were found. And imagine what it takes to transport a glass vessel across the Sahara Desert. But the site with the largest number of glass beads ever recovered from one site in sub-Saharan Africa is Igbo Ukwu, 
We previously saw the evidence for indigenous textiles, indigenous textiles preserved in the shrine site. In a different part of the site, Thurston Shaw encountered the burial of a high status person. And this reconstruction shows how the deceased was buried sitting upright on a wooden stool with two bronze staffs, a copper crown and fan holder, ivory tusks, and anklets and wristlets with over 100,000 glass beads and carnelian beads. The radiocarbon date for the site is very imprecise. We cannot say at present whether it's contemporary with the textiles in the shrine site in the 11th to 12th century, or perhaps it is a century or two earlier. And by the way, the shrine site had glass beads as well, 65,000. Whatever the precise date, we can only marvel at the astonishing concentration of high value items that reached this site deep in the Nigerian forest and were deposited in such extraordinary circumstances. But now we must turn to the question of where the glass was made that these beads were fashioned from. And in the period that we've been focusing on, the first to 12th centuries, a number of centers where glass was made from local raw materials are known. And a key point here is that the local geology of the sand in the glass recipe and the type of soda used combined to create the chemical fingerprint that characterizes the glass from a particular production area. So this is what helps us map out the connections. So the blue circles here show areas where glass was being made as of the end of the first millennium BC and onward. There was early centralized production of glass in Egypt, predominantly Alexandria, and Syria, Palestine, identifiable by its composition. And this differed from glass made in Mesopotamia over to Iran. Southern India had yet a different glass recipe. And Southeast Asia, question mark means we haven't actually found the sites where the glass was made, but it's very clear from the distribution of glass around here, there must have been a place that had that was making glass of a particular chemical composition, and then in China as well. Glass making later emerged in Europe after the spread of Islam into Mediterranean Europe in the seventh century. It also emerged in West Africa around 1000 AD at the site of Ife in Nigeria. There, African glassmakers devised an entirely novel recipe that makes it instantly recognizable by its chemical composition. The archaeological and analytical work that proved that glass was being locally made in Ife was primarily done by my former student, Tunde Babalola. He recovered tens of thousands of glass beads, um, very prominent among them, blue glass that you've seen, you see here. And he also found the crucibles used to melt the glass for bead making. The melted glass on the interior of these fragments shows the colors that the glass makers uh, were working with and the bead makers were working with. And here's an intact crucible. And in this graph, you can see how the amounts of elements and oxides in the bead chemistry allow us to identify the different source areas. So we can see that various sites with glass beads are connected to trade, works, trade networks that extend to the glass making centers of Iran and the Eastern Mediterranean. These types of beads were extremely popular thousands of miles away and that beads made in Ife were also sought and frequently traded. And I would say this uh, slide, which uh, Sonia Magnavita kindly provided to me, was done about five years ago. And we now have many, many more um, chemical composition analyses of glass beads from more sites. And they mimic these patterns. There are rare ones 
from Southeast Asia. This one is from Jenny Geno. What was it doing there around the first or second century AD? Um, we don't know. And uh, then this particular composition is a very early composition before the ninth century. But it is Iran and Ife that were extremely popular. And what we can do is show that these two types of glass beads from widely separated source areas were apparently both traded along networks uh, along the Niger River, shown by the green dots on this map. And they were all being traded about 1,000 years ago, um, linking forest, southern desert, over to the capital, the presumed capital of Mali at Kumbisala, and then down on the Senegal River uh, in near the gold fields. So our archaeological journey has revealed the hidden history of glass in West Africa, not only the early history of the glass bead trade into West Africa, but also the invention of a new glass recipe in the Nigerian forest by local glass workers. So while we know a great deal about historical connections with the forest regions after 1500, archaeology really opens up a whole new world of information about trade networks beginning 1,000 or more years earlier. And I hope that I've also convinced you about the power of archaeology to inform us in unexpected new ways about textiles and terracottas in Africa as well. So I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to open it up to questions if you have any. Thank you. If you have any questions for Dr. McIntosh, just please raise your hand, and I will come over to you with a mic. Currency trading that they used to do. Do you know what, how, what type of currency was traveled back and forth, or what they traded traded for? I spoke about currency. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking. It was their currency, not modern currency. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they were they were trade goods. They were exchanging things. Yes, for things that they considered to be of equivalent value. So the things that. Um, the trans-Saharan traders were, were coming after were uh, certainly gold. That was one of the main things driving them coming up from the forest regions. And uh, they, were, they also traded um, for slaves, sadly, and uh, various spices Malagata peppers from the forest region were one thing. And in return, they were bringing uh, brass, metals of various kinds, cloth, beads. Uh, the Arab chronicles tell us, you know, give us whole lists of things that they were bringing. And I think that it's really important to note that trade was not just operating at long distances organized by folks in North Africa and the desert people who ran the caravans, the camel caravans. We had lots of middle range and local trade networks that were extremely active and formed the bulwark of these longer uh, trade networks um, because they provisioned uh, the folks who were operating in the desert where it was too dry to grow any kinds of crops. So we know that trade was coming up from the inland Niger Delta, from the Niger River area, to the southern desert uh, entrepots and trade towns, provisioning them with millet and rice uh, so they could feed themselves. And then dates from the oases were something that traders would pick up en route across the desert and trade those into. Sub-Saharan Africa. So there's a whole variety of things, but a whole complex intermeshed set of local, regional, and long-distance trade networks in operation with all sorts of trade goods. Does that answer your question adequately? OK.
So my assumption is that the Sahara was not for them what it is today. And we're talking about trade networks and feeding themselves, but um, if I remember correctly, it, it, this, I, I know the Sahara is expanding today. I assume it was maybe less dry and more grassy a thousand years ago. Yeah, that's an excellent question uh, that people uh, sort of debate because some of the Arab chroniclers tell us about some of these southern um, desert trade towns that were well watered and people were growing crops and whatnot. And we know that's relatively small variations in the water budget of these Sahelian, dry Sahelian environs can make a tremendous difference. So possibly things fluctuated and there may have been periods of time when things were relatively good. But we do have at one of the sites in the Southern Sahara that was, uh, uh, we think, a major trade town, the site of Tegdaust, which is probably the site of Audegost that the Arab chroniclers talked about early on. They have excavated and they have found wells. And they've simply tracked the depth of the wells because that's tracking the water table. And through time, in the period from about the 9th to 12th century, it just went down, 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 down. And then the site was finally abandoned in the 14th century. So that's one piece of evidence that suggests that it may have been better in the 9th, 10th, 11th century, but then it started getting much more arid. But certainly the people who were operating in the deep desert, in the central Sahara, um, that the central Sahara area has been you know, hyper arid like it is today pretty much for the past 2,000 years. So these camel nomads were supremely well adapted to travel long distances in that dry desert and then a whole network of oases developed um, to provision them and for stopping places. And something that I found extremely interesting, you know, the Sahara surface has two kinds of surfaces, uh, the erg surface that's sandy and the reg surface that's stony. They have bred different kinds of camels with different kinds of feet to walk on the different kinds of surface. And so caravans would swap out camels at some of these oases for a wholly different type, depending on the terrain that they were about to traverse. Who knew that it was that complicated, but it was. A lot of the sites you mentioned uh, are close to the gold fields that were located in Ghana, mm -hmm. those other areas. So was gold a factor in affecting glass production? And was gold used in the... Was gold? A factor in... Can you hold the mic up to Oh, you? I'm sorry. Thank was, you. was gold a factor in where these bead production areas were? And was gold ever used in the glass production itself? Was gold ever used in the glass production itself? Oh, this is interesting. Um, so if I, did I understand your question in the gold producing areas, did gold produce the, affect the production yes. of the glass? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so now I'm going back deep in my memory banks at this point. It, there is a, a, a type of glass bead that has a gold foil interior. And a couple of those beads have been found. Now, this was a kind of bead, if I recall correctly, that was produced uh, earlier in Egypt. Um, and uh, I don't know, I can't actually tell you. Uh, that I, this, I believe, is a trade bead coming in. I, there is no evidence that I know of from Ife, which is the only place we know where people were actually producing glass and then making beads from it in Africa. Um, that they were that they were doing that. Uh, the reason I mentioned that is the other areas of glass production you had pointed out to was southern India. Yes. There are, it's also the location of the Kola gold fields there. So I was just curious uh -huh. about that. Oh, interesting. And so, do you know? Is there any evidence there that it? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Uh, gold tends to attract people yes. and industry. It's very interesting that way. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. A 
Dr. McIntosh, I'm curious, uh, to what extent are African countries able to reclaim or rehome their artifacts from museums, uh, particularly in Europe and the United States? Yeah, so that, that is a great question and uh, speaks to the comment that I made that the climate for, uh, for uh, antiquities and artifacts in museums today is markedly different than it was 25 or so years ago. And we have seen in the last, really I would say the last uh, four or five years, um, a, a sort of sea change, um, not least because uh, President Macron of France declared that all African uh, objects in French museums should be repatriated to Africa, but then he commissioned a study um, of objects, and they found that some incredible percentage, 80 to 90 percent, of African heritage objects were located outside of Africa. And so there has been an impetus that has built up over a number of decades. I mean, the repatriation process has begun in other areas in the United States with the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act. Um, we have had a lot of uh, historical experience developing provenance research, trying to figure out what is the history of ownership of the objects in our collections, in our museums? And museums have established policies whereby they have to do this kind of research. That lets us know when things came out of certain countries. And increasingly, people are using the, the, the date of 1970, when the UNESCO Convention on the Prote Pre Prevention and Protection Prevention of illicit, it's got a long title, of, of illicit trade and traffic in cultural property was signed uh, by UNESCO as a date before which they would like to see objects have come into museums. And if they came in, if they cannot prove that they came in before that date, then museums are doing some very hard thinking about what should be the disposition of those and should they go back. And a number of museums in the Horniman Museum in Britain, uh, museums in Germany, museums in France, and some of our museums have voluntarily repatriated artifacts. Um, recently, notably, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts repati repatriated um, terracotta statuettes, to, two terracotta statuettes voluntarily to Mali that had been donated by one of their former trustees and major donors. So this is happening much more frequently. Does suppose, that answer your question I suppose, adequate? I suppose it's difficult to go after private collectors. It is. Then it becomes more a matter of sort of personal, uh, personal sentiment um, about whether the individual collector is interested or curious on how this object came into the hands of the dealer from whom they bought it, um, and whether that knowledge would change how they feel about having the object. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, my former students, um, these are all students that um, uh, I have worked with in the field and who demonstrated a real aptitude and dedication to archaeology. And they have, in almost every case, 
um, indicated that they would be going back to their home countries. And so uh, Mamadou Cisse is very active in um, the Ministry of Culture, in, and he is in charge of archaeological research in the country. And I've trained several students in Senegal, um, one of whom became the head of the um, Ifan Museum in Dakar, and is now in charge of the Ifan Lab at the University of Sheikh Anta Diop, uh, Dakar. And Tunde Babalola um, has had quite a storied career. He received um, a postdoc at Harvard, and then he received a postdoc at Cambridge. And he is now working in laboratories with the experts who do glass chemistry. He's, not, he's an archaeologist. He's not a glass chemist. So he has to work in those labs. And um, he has gone back and to Nigeria and done additional work now at Igbo Ukwu, in addition to Ife. And we're just waiting to see. It's very hard for him to actually get a position in Nigeria. They have a very large archaeological establishment. It's basically a case of waiting for someone to retire, right? <laughs> and not so different from some of our places in the United States. So we're just waiting to see what the next chapter will be for Tunde. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much, and thank you to Dr. McIntosh for such an interesting talk and conversation, and we appreciate your time being here with us at the Dallas Museum of Art. Thank you all for joining us, and we hope that you'll join us again soon. Thank you. Thank you.